name is Mark Miller with Back Endless, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about Flex and the back end of the services concept. Uh, how many of you are familiar with FAST with back end of the service? Show of hands. One, two. Cool. Let me give you a quick, quick overview of what it is about. So, uh, I assume everyone is familiar with Flex, which is a client side development technology for majority of applications. There is a client side and there is a server side. Right? The client side is what you see on the screen and the browser and so on. The server side is typically responsible for a very finite set of things. That's where, you, where your database is, where all the business processes work, file uploads are being handled, users registered and so on. Right? So, uh, and there is some sort of communication protocol between the client side and the server side. So on the server side, if you take all the business logic out, custom code, and you leave just pure, you know, your, your code to deal with the database or to handle file uploads, sending out messages, that code is pretty much the same across all applications. But clearly, database schemas will, will be different, and SQL is different, but the concept of working with the database is the same regardless of whether it's a social app, line of business app, whatever. So with backend as a service, what it does, most common server-side functionality that you can find in application development is available as a, as a service, as a programmable service. Meaning, there is an API that is published that can be consumed by the client side to get, to get the server-side coding done. So since it is available as a service, it is basically ready to go, it means that you can focus on application development just by building the client side. As a result, you save a lot of time. So, and, uh, statistically, about 50% of the time is being spent on the service and coding. And if it is done, it means you can develop apps 50% faster and cheaper. Okay. So, so all those services combined, that's what the back end of the service concept is. Okay. So Essentially, as a, as, a, as, a, as a fast solution, there are many of them. We'll talk about all the available options. It's a, it's a back end that could be either in the cloud or could be installed standalone. So it's, it's the server side of your applications. The APIs that I talk about, in most of the cases that you will find out there, those APIs are available for in the form of native libraries. So if you build a Flex app, you're going to have a library that is basically as WC that includes all those APIs. If you're building for iOS or Android or JavaScript, you'll find native libraries. So the actual API would be customized, specialized in the client side environment. And then there are some solutions with that say, well, we publish just REST API. In every single client side environment, we have to figure out how to make those REST. Uh, one of the biggest benefits from, from, from what I see, and because of the complexity model, is the scalability factor. It's very few applications when they're released are ready to scale on day one. You know, scalability, in most of the cases, is an afterthought. With BAS, the biggest promise that the concept makes is that the scalability is, is just a feature. Because the back end, once you start consuming it, is ready to scale, regardless of the load. It scales automatically and completely transparently to the client application, which is, which is a huge thing. And then there are a lot of value features like analytics, uh, security, scalability, as I mentioned, and that's so on. So, as far as the actual services, uh, since BAS is being positioned as a general service platform, the services, they range from pretty much, uh, they cover most of the functionality that we need to serve. Managing users, being able to handle logins, registrations, working with the database, handling file uploads, geolocation queries, so all those services typically would, would be found back into the service plan. And I'm going to give you a more detailed overview of how each individual would work. Right? So here we have, you probably cannot see from back there, but uh, essentially just visual visualization of what I said. You have a bunch of services, and they're available to make them part. Now, the, the beauty in this picture, aside from that, that I, that I made it, and I really like it, but is, is that you have different types of clients communicating with the same backend, sharing that backend, and 
being able to exchange this information. And then what happens quite often out there is when you build an iOS app, an Android app, and Flex app, and data starts is being shared between different environments, you have to do a lot of extra work. So for instance, if you're saving an object from Android, you have to retrieve that object from action screen. You would have to do some additional massage of your data to prepare it, put it into action screen objects and so on. With backend as a service, it is done automatically. And the reason that you have native libraries for each individual client's environment. And as a result, it once again translates to additional cost savings because you can do things significantly faster by using this particular approach. You cannot see what this is, but this is really just a printout from a Wikipedia page of all the companies that are in the backend as a service space. So there are a lot of a lot of competition in there. Last time I checked, there were 40 plus vendors. And as a result, there is a variety of different options. There are open source solutions, commercial, free. Uh, clearly, the, the quality of service will be different. But if you are, if this approach sounds interesting, then definitely need to do your research and figure out which one would work the best for you. And then there are clearly there is a path of the leaders. And if you're interested, we can talk about who they are. And I'll, I'll tell you my honest opinion. But anyway, so the, the good thing is that it's a fairly saturated play, saturated space. Uh, th this will give you a fairly good idea of, of the actual concept. Because if, if it does, I'd like to actually do a few demos of, of uh, coding that, that, which, so you can see what it would take to actually work with. Uh, and uh, for this, what I did is I put together a few coding examples. And uh, since we have uh, sort of a limited internet connectivity, I do have uh, my own installation here in the laptop, which is exactly the same as what we run in the cloud. And here I'm going to use Backendless uh, because I'm not, I'm not trying to do a sales pitch. It's a free product for me to use. And I'm familiar with the most. So it was a fairly logical choice for me to actually use it for So here, what you see is a, is a development console. And this is the front end for your back. Whenever you start working with, with backend as a service, pretty much everyone will provide a console. Just so you can see the data, you can set up security, you can, uh, manage provisions, do backups, and so on. I'm going to start with persistence, since this is the most uh, commonly used function. Right? So for, from a data store perspective, here I have no tables at all. Right? And uh, there are two different schools of thought. One is you can create the tables by hand using a console create the schema, define columns, and so on, and start programming a system. Another approach is you actually create classes. And just by the virtue of working with APIs, as soon as you start saving objects, tables and schemas will be created by them, which is exactly what I'm going to do. So notice that there are no tables here at all. Um, right here, I created a couple of classes. One of them is called order. And I'm going to capture this presentation mode. And as you can see, it's a very simple class. It's not extended from any of our framework classes. It just defines public public fields. And you can create getters, et cetera, whatever your preferences are. But anyway, so there is a there is an order class. And here I have the name of the order, address, order amount, and uh, a collection of order items, which is an array. Okay? Uh, and then similarly to this order, another class that I created this order item. And then here, there are just a couple of properties. So essentially, my hierarchy of objects is there is an order that contains a collection of order items. So what I'm going to do next is this. We're going to create save, uh, save an order. And uh, am I still on the full screen? Can you guys see it OK? Should I make it larger? So take a look at this code. It's, it's fairly trivial. We create an instance of order, populate properties, and then we call one function save. We basically pass in this instance, right? And the, just by doing so, that particular object is actually going to be uploaded to the back, back end of the service. Tables are going to be created, and objects are going to be persistent. And uh, Another method, which is a variation of this, right in the loop, or 20 iterations, I create an order, and then for that order, I create order item, and 
and I store it and store it in this one, and I'm just going to save it. Right? So let's call this one just so we can get more data in there. So here it is. I'm going to invoke save order with items. <coughs> Alright, so those items were saved, and if we were to switch to our console and refresh, now we see that tables were created completely automatically. So we have those 20 orders here, and then for each order we have an order plan. And then notice that if we were to switch to the schema view, it is it, 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 it replicates our code one-to-one. -one. So for every single property in the class, there is a column created, proper types are established, and there is a relationship order to order items. So you don't need to be a DBA, you don't need to know anything about databases, but you can actually start prototyping or developing completely without any knowledge of the database technology or any SQL for the matter either. And then when we browse this uh, this data, you can actually see the links and relations between the particular order and the corresponding order item. Okay? Now, the next demo that I'm going to do is And I'm going to run 
that particular native iOS chat in the, from my Xcode. One thing that I'm going to change is the URL of the server because I'm talking to the local version, not the, not the cloud based one. Notice that this is this is a fully functional chat app for iOS. And once again, I didn't have to write a single line of code that already now I have not only server side but the client side. All right, so this is my uh, iOS chat. I actually send messages, they just show up. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my f uh, idea uh, and uh, actually run a test where I publish a message from from ActionScript into the same messaging channel, and my iOS client will pick it up. So here I have publish test, and it's really just one line of code, publish a message. And if you guys can see it, I'll make it a little bit larger. So notice, that again, with the messaging publish the channel, this is the name of the channel, and this is my message. I want it to be published to, uh, into the messaging channel. So let's run this guy. So there you go. So this guy has published this message and my OS picked it up. And we have basically communication going on between Flex and iOS. And if we were to add Android or JavaScript or whatever, you can easily do that. It's basically just a, exactly the same API across the board. Now in this particular example, when I publish this message, it is a string. As you can see, it is a hello iOS, but it doesn't have to be string. It could actually be an object or an array of objects or really any kind of data structure. And the cool thing about it is if you have, let's say, a class uh, person or order or whatever, you send an send instance of that class out into the chat. And then when the re receiving side gets that message, it will morph it into a native representation that particular client side environment. So if you have class person in Objective C, it will arrive as a native Objective C instance of class person, and so on. So it's it, it, it does it does work pretty cool because you don't have to spend any time morphing data from one environment to another. Right? And then from the code generation perspective, So from the code generation perspective, there is a bunch of stuff that you can actually do. But uh, let's focus on Flex here. So uh, from the login perspective, so let's talk about user login and registration. Whenever you see a registration form in an application, every single item in that form is going to correspond to the property of the user. Right? So whenever you ask for an email address, phone number, address, age, gender, whatever, those are the user properties. Okay. So here, what you can do is you can define those user properties using this interface. You just say add property, and let's say it is going to be add age as, a, as an integer. Click save. So now we have these user properties. Okay. Now, creating code to handle logins, registration forms, it's no brainer. Everybody can do it. But if the system can do it for you, and you save time, I think that's pretty awesome. So if we go back here to code generation, select Flex, and say, hey, we need code generation for login and registration for my app. Click download the project, get the zip file. Let's open up this guy. So now we have source code to actually handle Registration and login. Okay. Uh, one thing that I can do once again here is the URL of the service. And let's run it. Boom. So at this point, for your backend, 
login and registration are free. Okay, notice that here I have properties for exactly the same user properties that were defined in the back. Okay, so if I were to register now, this is my email account. Register. And I go back to my backend or console, click data, users. Now under users right here, I do have the register feature. Okay. So the whole flow from generating code to your backend works. We can take this code, skin it, adapt it to your application. And the only thing that is that is mean for you is really huge time savings. Uh, something else that I wanted to mention is it's quite often whenever uh, Data enters the backend and needs to be validated. That is true both for users who are registering for your app and any data objects that you're saving. And then to, to validate this data, there is a concept of validators. So, for instance, for email, you know, the, for one of the validators could be built in email address for the data. But anyway, or if you want it to be custom, you can just type in your regular expression, and then regex will be used to validate data. As it enters the back. Okay. So that's uh, that's also quite important. Whenever users register, by the way, quite often they would want to validate their email address just to make sure that they're not spam bots or actual users. So if you want to enable email information, all you do is you turn it on right here, require email information. And at this point, if I were to register, I will not be able to log in until I click on the email, on the link in the email that the system generates and sends to the user. By the way, if you want to customize what that email looks like, you go to email templates, and here this is the text of the email which you can just type in and say, hey, thank you for registering. Okay. And if you want to customize who that email comes from, no problem. You go to manage, select email settings, and right here you specify your SMTP server and your own email address. So you can customize this backend completely where no one will ever know that you're actually using the backend as a service system. Working just like your own server. Okay. Quite often, whenever you work with an application, you still need to put some business logic in the service side. Yes, I know I said that you don't have to do any service side coding. Most of the cases you don't. But sometimes you do. And in order to do this, pretty much uh, most of the established backend as a service players, they provide a way to customize how the service is run. And the way you do it is through service side coding. And right here, this is the interface that we provide for you to override default behavior. And there are two different ways to do this. One is through the event handlers. The event handlers, if you picture the application chain, the client sends a request, that request enters the backend, and there is a default service that does whatever, puts data into the database, and then sends the response back. So you can you could you might want to customize this behavior by injecting your own code before the default behavior or after. And one way to do this is, let's say for data service, you say add the data handler, and then before, uh, let's say remove, for a particular table, click save, and it actually generates this Java code, which you can download right here. There's a download code. You get this code, you put in your own logic, and you deploy it back into the cloud. At this point, you have your own custom validator uh, or event handler for that particular. And that code, your own code, will get, will automatically scale if the traffic goes up, so your code will always be available as well. So from that perspective, you can introduce your own custom business logic on the service side. Uh, another another uh, form of custom business logic uh, we call timers. And that's basically a piece of code that will be executed on a particular schedule. Right? So to create a timer, you go to this user interface and specify Schedule. So if you want to run it, if you want it to run weekly, say repeat every let's say two weeks on Mondays and Fridays. Or if you want it to be something more elaborate, let's say monthly, and you want it to run every January and September on particular days, so like in the yard. Or if or first and second Wednesday, click say, and now you have this piece of code that is generated where you inject your own custom logic. That logic is going to be executed accordingly to the schedule that you have this way. Let's see. 
Uh, geolocation. Let's, how many of you are familiar with Uber, which is uh, an alternative to Texas service? Right? You've heard about it? Basically, on the, on, the, on the phone, you can open it up and see where available taxi or cabs are in your area. And you can click on one and say, hey, I want this taxi to pick me up. So there is a geolocation functionality in there. Okay? Creating something like this with back end as a service would be trivial. For the reason that pretty much all back end service platforms and providers, they provide an API for you to add a geo point, which is just a set of coordinates into the geolocation store. And there is an API to do queries. So you can say, uh, run a search within certain radius for all the geo points of a particular quality. And then those points come back from the back end, and you just render them on the screen. So something like this, you know, normally you would spend a lot of time creating all those crafting algorithms to run the searches for the points. Here is just one line of code. You can do that now, with this, with the way we approach it, in addition to the coordinates that you store in the in the, the backend, you can attach additional metadata. And metadata is a collection of key value pairs, right? So. And that could be just arbitrary collection of key value pairs. So for instance, with the same Uber analogy, your metadata could be type of car, SUV, black car, whatever, or you know, price, one dollar, two dollars, and so on. So whenever you're on a query, your SQL for that query could say type of car equals SUV and price less than three dollars. So whatever geo points that have that metadata will come back to you as a result of the query. And you can just run your own screen. Uh, there is a built-in file service that you can use for hosting purposes. So you can actually host your Flex app, JavaScript app right there and on that back. And you don't need to buy any additional file space from hosting providers. And you can map your own data. And also, there is an API to upload files attached into data objects, shared users, and so on. So that's a, that's a fairly general purpose functionality. Finally, uh, I want to mention that there is a media service, because uh, we have a limited API for that at this point. It's only Flex and iOS. And using this service, you can create video chats, uh, record video from the devices or from the browser on the server, and share those video files with other users. Or, or, or it could be live. And for that, once again, all the complexity of managing media server with RTMP and all that stuff is completely different from the development and consumer as a service. Okay? Uh, so that's that's the, that's the management concept. If you guys have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. But uh, I know if it, if it sparked any interest in you guys doing your research, there are a couple of things that you need to keep in mind. So if you're building an app, of a backend as a service system, that becomes an important part of your app. So if it goes down or something happens with the backend, it doesn't matter how much time you spend with the client side because it's not going to work. So it's very important to do your research and think carefully. So the couple of factors is uh, the stability of the, of the actual system. There are ways, a number of ways to check stability. Okay? Run your own stress tests. See if the APIs are uh, elaborate enough to support edge cases, uh, edge cases. Uh, how much support is going on in the forums, and so on. So uh, that's you know, what I already mentioned as far as actual stability. Uh, stress testing is important because a lot of a lot of uh, vendors they will claim that it never goes down, and it's super stable. I make this claim because we run stress tests daily. So every time there is a minor change, we go through a lot of vigorous testing and put, put, put the service under a very heavy load just to know that it is game. So what, what we encourage our users to actually do is Alright, uh, technical maturity of the APIs. That's always a good sign to check uh, before you start building. So uh, many times when the APIs are published, there are going to be two different versions. Synchronous and asynchronous. Well, clearly, in action script, everything is asynchronous. But if you have a vision to start building native apps as well, make sure to check that Android and iOS APIs are available as synchronous and asynchronous. 
Why? Because if you're building for mobile and, and, and you start using synchronous APIs because only those are available, it will it will result in a substandard user experience. Because on a mobile device, if it's all synchronous and it's let's say single thread environment where you, you cannot you know, step outside of the box to establish by the GFI API, yeah, that's going to create problems. Uh, for messaging, for especially published subscribe messaging, if you if you are going to be building a messaging app, check with whether it's uh, using uh, polling versus push. Because if, it's, if it uses polling and you're building a mobile app, every single request from the clients to pull for messages will start draining the memory. And uh, an alternative, a more mature approach is to use, is to use push. The server pushes those messages and the client doesn't have them. But that is harder to implement. That's why I'm uh, bringing this up. Uh, one thing that you will notice with backend and service players is that many of them, uh, we are excluded, claim that there is no lock, there is no vendor lock. One thing that I want to say there is 100% vendor lock. Okay? If you start building uh, on top of a backend and service system, you will be locked into the APIs of that claim. Okay? For the reason that there is no standardization across the APIs. Right. Some of the names that you will see in there, and if you want to do your research, just Google backend as a service, you will see pretty much top 10 players will get the first two Google pages. Okay? And then there will be names like Parse, Convey, Cloudmine, and so on. Once you start coding against those APIs, this is it. It's switching to someone else would literally mean rewriting at least the communication layer for your application. So don't believe those who say there is no vendor lock. That's not the truth. There is. And it comes from a vendor in that space. Uh, data ownership. It's very important to check who owns the data. Okay? Because if you start accumulating a lot of data in your app, one, one day you want to move out and go somewhere else, there's got to be a way to export the data out. Because data must belong to the actual bill, not, not the provider of the, of the bank. Okay? So always look for the data export capability. Uh, external authentication. This is useful if you already have an existing, existing application, you're building something new, and you don't want the users to re-register. There's got to be a way to integrate with your identity management system, whether it's LDAP, Active Directory, or whatever. Because if users have to re-register to use some new app that you develop, or let's say a variation of an existing app, that's going to be substandard user experience. Look for the way to tap into an existing identity management system. Uh, cloud infrastructure dependency. Pretty much everyone that you will see in the back of the service space is going to be a cloud service, okay? which means including us. So the service that runs you know, somewhere in the cloud, the Amazon, the Google App Engine, Azure, doesn't matter. However, one thing that we do differently, there are a few others who are similarly positioned. We provide a way for you to take our product and actually run it in your own environment, your own laptop, your own data center. By doing so, we've got the dependency of Amazon, which is where we run this year. And then you basically, all the data is like getting locally on your own servers. So that, that could be an important thing, especially if you were running up against compliance like HIPAA and so on, where the data must, must stay within your organization. Uh, of course, ease of use will be one of the first things that you will notice. Uh, APIs that are not easy to use is probably a bad sign. And the same thing for online tools, console, documentation, and so on. Um, and that's, that's it. So, uh, any questions, I'll be happy to answer. You can find us at backhandless.com. We're also on Twitter and Facebook. It's slash backhandless and backhandless. So it's fairly consistent. That's uh, that's that's all that I have prepared for today. Yes. Uh, yeah, this is pretty cool. Um, and I was just going to ask. Um, I'm the ability to access against the API from other languages besides the ones that you've shown. I should be using Python, for example. Right. So the way we approach this is we have five SDKs: iOS, Android, JavaScript, Windows Phone, and ActionScript. And for all others, we publish REST APIs. So for anyone else that we do not have a native library, we will REST. And the REST, uh, the 
coverage or functionality with REST, it's 100%. So everything that I have demonstrated with native APIs will be available with REST as well. Yes? What type of databases we support? I'll answer that question. However, the build app against BAS, the actual type of database that we have internally, should be completely transparent because for you it is a service. Right? So we could be using Excel, but we will never know because for you, the point of entry is API and you, you get a guaranteed response structured as you expect. But technically speaking, we use a combination of MongoDB and MySQL. Now, one thing that we are working on is uh, we are uh, seeing a lot of customers that say we already have an existing database. A lot of data in there for us to migrate, migrate the data into the cloud for post version is going to be tough. And uh, uh, we are adding a capability where you go into the console, you can attach your existing database just through a JTBC connection stream. And then all your tables will become available to the console. And you can use our API, pretty much all of them, to, to work with your data without additional migration. Yes? Do things like transaction support? Excellent question. Not yet. Well, every, every single operation that you initiate with the API is transactional. So if something happens, let's say, during an update, an update would, may appear like a single call, but let's say if you are saving an object that has some relationships, so it could be a deep hierarchy, there is a number of number of uh, SQL statements that is taking place. If there is a failure, we roll back the whole thing. So there is definitely transaction around every single API call. However, if you want to chain multiple operations, like update this object, delete this one, save that one, group it into a single transaction, we don't do that. Server-side custom code. Absolutely, that's 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 uh, our standard answer today. So if you if you need to have more complex control over a sequence of operations, you're ready to jump and deploy on the server side. Okay. Yeah. Question. Yes. Uh, what is the registration? Yes. Absolutely. There is. Uh, it's actually available today for all clients. Whenever you need to do something like this, you go into a console, you put in your Facebook ID and API ID or Twitter, and then we simplify the whole process because we'll say from Android and then from Flex, we integrate Facebook login. It's a fairly tedious process. You have, there is a lot that you have to do. We simplified it to like two steps. Do you have any plans to use MVP2 also into Google? We're working on that. Yeah, just use the Google. Something like Elasticsearch, you say you have MongoDB. Excellent. Something like Elasticsearch, you say you have MongoDB, you need to add some kind of feature like that. How would that happen? That's, that's a good question. Uh, we are researching that subject with Elasticsearch, with Solar, with some of, some of the uh, server side and enterprise plays that are going on uh, by just doing the space. So right now, we don't have an answer specifically what we're going to do. The vision is that if it is a service-side service, if it does something useful for developers, there's got to be a way for us to enable it and make it easier for developers to use it. So we're definitely experimenting in that space. Okay. Thank you, guys.